And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars, and welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Well, today we're going to be examining a very important feature of Bible prophecy. There are many prophets in the world, of course. I I recall uh, some years ago the teachings of the great French prophet Nostradamus was everywhere. Uh, And some of his prophecies seem very close to, you know, what the Bible said, but there was always some variation. Uh, And many people believed Nostradamus, but did not believe in the Bible. And that led to a lot of (laughs) very, very much pain and so forth. Uh, And of course, many uh, uh, unavoidable uh, errors in judgment. Uh, Today, people tell me that the Antichrist has been found out and he's going to be a a Muslim. Many people tell me that he's going to be an Arab. And they say that because today, of course, with terrorism and ISIS and so forth, it seems that, you know, we're really uh, at loggerheads with Islam. But, of course, if we look back uh, uh, several hundred years ago, Europe was at loggerheads with uh, Islam, and Islam had uh, come out from uh, Turkey and uh, the Middle East and had conquered a lot of Europe and it was into Spain and Morocco and was moving up the continent before they were finally stopped and pushed back. And today you can see much Spanish architecture is actually of Islamic origin. That's right. You go to Spain today and you'll see much of the architecture, the buildings and so forth look like they came right out of Turkey or one of the uh, Middle Eastern countries which, of course, that architecture did. So, you know, we, we go with the fads, and we, we look and, and we, we gather that Bible prophecy is based on what is faddish today. You know, many people told me some years ago that they knew who the Antichrist was. I said, well, who is it? They said, well, Henry Kissinger. He's the Antichrist, and they... They had all the reasons for it. Others told me it was Richard Nixon. Somebody uh, brought a whole book and he came to me and wanted me to offer the book. And the book proposed that John F. Kennedy was slain, but would be, uh, you know, restored and that he would therefore become the beast, the beast that was wounded as if killed, but he came back again. So, of course, I knew that was not true, too. And there are all these theories and ideas and so forth. But, you know, I decided many years ago I would go to the Bible, direct to the Word of God, and find out all these great riddles. I would seek out what the Bible said, and from what the Bible said, I could determine the last days. Now, that means a lot of study, of course. And I want you to understand that I have now written several books, uh, particularly my last two books, and I'm writing another book now, and all of them are related to the last days and to Bible prophecy. And I also want you to know, my dear friends, that I would not dare to look at current history and say, well, that that's a prophetic thing here or prophecy there or prophecy being fulfilled in some respect without it meeting every criteria of the Bible. And when you go to the Bible, you find some very interesting things. You find, for example, that the Jews seem to be implicated in the last days. In fact, it seems the Jews have a very long history in the Bible from the Old Testament all the way to the book of Revelation. And it seems that 
that relationship in the Bible is sometimes good and sometimes extremely evil. It makes me recall the the writings of Sir Winston Churchill, the great uh, British uh, Prime Minister in World War II, and for some years before and after. But Sir Winston Churchill once surveyed the Jewish people and their accomplishments, so-called, in taking over the great empire of Russia and translating that empire into a horrible, brutal, deathly, bloody, monstrous kingdom of communism. And Churchill said, it seems as if the Jews are destined to bring about not only the Christ figure, which they did in Jesus Christ, but also they will produce the Antichrist, the opposite. In other words, he said, all that we can picture is good in the world. All that we can say is wonderful and, and, and godly and good in Jesus Christ will be met in that one small ethnic race, that that bloodline of the Jews, also the great figure of evil, the Antichrist, the beast, the man with the number 666, so that both the good and the evil will come out of, of Judaism, out of basically Israel. And I wondered why Winston Churchill would propose such a thing. If God decided that he would bring Jesus out of the Jews, why would he turn around and bring the Antichrist out of the same Jews? It seems such a, a, an anomaly, it seems like a, an opposition, a contradiction. Why would God do such a thing? And then, and then I, I discovered something. It would be just like God to do such a thing. Let, let me explain to you, my dear friends. You see, if there is one race on earth that could be so blessed by God that from that race would be produced the Christ, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. That race would be so uh, uh, puffed up, so uh, uh, proud of their heritage. They would say, from us came the Christ. And they would be so, they would be, they, they would feel that they were so superior to every other race. Because Christ came out of their blood. Came out of the loins of, of, of their great men and women. So, so Christ Jesus would somehow negate that feeling by bringing forth the opposite of Christ, the Antichrist. The one who opposes Christ. The one man in all the world who is the exact opposite, who is full of Satan, who would seek to contradict Jesus Christ, who would declare that he is God and above all gods, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And so the Jews have no reason for declaring that they are superior, that they are uh, so godlike, that from their blood came the Christ. If they are forced to turn around and say, but from our same blood, from this blood came the Antichrist, the epitome of all evil, Satan himself incarnated in human flesh. So how how can you <laughs> how can you be arrogant? How how can you claim that you're a superior when from you came both good and evil to such a maximum extent? So I understood. But it seems that God took care of this in other ways too. Yes, from the Jews came Jesus Christ, but but they rejected him. 
Wouldn't it have been wonderful if the Jews had said, he, he's our Messiah. He's the one. And, and, and they, they held him and they, they said, Oh, Hosanna to the king. And, and they swept him into high office and they gave him the, the crown and, and, and he, he, they worshiped him and him alone. And, and all of the Jews bow down and worship the great king Jesus. But instead, they said, he is, he, he is not one of us. He is not our king. The Jews said, we reject him. The Jews said, this, this man, he's a deviant. This man is evil. This man is even bills above the prince of devils. And the very one, the just one, the one whom God had sent, the one without sin, the one who loved every man, every woman, was bashed and beaten and cruelly and vindictively used and was crucified. How could that be? The very Son of God, the Messiah, the one that God had sent was so, so battered, so beaten, so vilely used. But someday, Jesus said, I come in the name of the Father, and you rejected me. But someday, one will come in his own name. Him you will receive. Oh, so he told the Jews, that one that comes, that Antichrist, you will receive him. You will, oh, you will uh, make a big deal about him. Oh, you'll, you'll part the, almost the seas for, say, this is the one that we've been waiting for. Be gone, Jesus. This one, this latter days one, this is the one. This is the, the one that has all of the, the, the characteristics that we've been looking for. He's a great warrior, a great statesman, a great wise man. He's not like that Jesus, that poor man born of a carpenter and his silly wife. No, no, no. This one is a great one. He is Messiah. He will be king of the world. And they will do everything in their power to make him so. Now, in Bible prophecy, we see these scenes depicted. And God, in his great wisdom, gave us certain symbols, certain uh, almost magical, supernatural symbols to understand. For example, in Revelation 9, he speaks of a great beast, a great beast who, who, who comes up out of the pit of hell in the last days. This great beast is given a name, and his name is Abaddon, Abaddon. In Hebrew, Abaddon means destroyer. Now, I explain in my new book, The Destroyer, he is the Antichrist. Yes, my friends, the Antichrist is at hand. I don't know if he's alive today. I think we are in that age. I think we're right on the precipice. He he must be, and maybe you've seen this Antichrist figure. Maybe you've turned on your TV screens. Maybe he's he's somebody we know. Maybe... He's a mighty person. There are several candidates, of course. I'm not going to name a name, but I'll tell you one thing. I want you to know that you'll know. You'll eventually know who he is. But the world won't know. No, if you're a Christian, you will know because God says you are one of the wise. Now, you may not have graduated from Harvard you may not have graduated at all. You, you may not even have a high school diploma, but that doesn't, that's not what makes you wise. 
You know, when I was teaching at the University of Texas, I would walk around campus and go in the various halls and uh, of the various schools and the engineering and the pharmaceutical, and I would go over to uh, uh, school of uh, law and so forth, and I would see a number of professors. And and I said, you know, which of all of these is the most wise? Who is it that we are to believe in? And then I realized, well, none of them. These men are not wise. They're, they're great instruction. They're, they're being at the University of Texas at Austin, one of the greatest universities in the world, uh, with, with maybe 50,000 students and, and uh, several thousand instructors and professors did not make them wise men. The Bible says that it is God who chooses the wise. And I want to tell you right now, there are many people listening to my voice who are of the wise. There are many of you who write to me. You write me letters. You write me cards. Sometimes you phone me. Sometimes I don't hear from you at all, except that maybe someday you'll order a book or uh, an audio tape or a CD from us or video. But I, 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 I look over the field of everybody in this ministry. And, of course, there are people outside this ministry, too. And I realize how many wise ones we have. You know, the Bible says in the last days, the wicked will do wickedly, but none of the wicked shall understand. It says, however, that the wise shall understand. The wicked, oh my. You know, many of them will do great deeds and they'll think they're doing great things. Many will actually kill and think they're doing it for God. They killed Jesus. Why, they thought they were saving. They were helping the Judaism religion. They, they were, they were fixing the Talmud. They were doing what the rabbis wanted. They cared less about the Old Testament. They were wanting to do what the Talmud said to do. So they kill the son of glory. They killed him. Later on, I want you to read, dear friends, the story of Stephen in the book of Acts, chapter 6 and 7. How Stephen was caught in the streets as he was preaching. Shortly after the death of Jesus, he was preaching the name of Jesus and, and, and telling the people of Jesus that Jesus was the Christ. And the, the, the men, the so-called holy men of the Jews came upon him and they were infuriated. Who gives you the right to preach of this Jesus that we put on the tree, that we sent to the cross, this Beelzebub? Who gives you the right to talk about him? And Stephen brave and confident in his Savior, stood up to them all. And he gave them a sermon for the ages. You'll want to read that sermon. It's a brief, short sermon. Yes, he said, I, I in so many words, I have a few words for you, you men of Jerusalem. And he reminded them of their history and of their worship of the great star God who they still worship today as the six-pointed star. You worship this star God, but that's not God, he said. You have killed the just one. You have killed the very son of God. Oh, they were mad. They were so angry. They, they set upon him and they beat him. They beat him to a pulp. But it's recorded in the book of Acts that Stephen was a different kind of person. He didn't have a, a, <laughs> a 
he, he wasn't the kind that you would think was argu- argumentative at all. In, in fact, it said that he had a countenance like an angel. He had, he was a young man, a handsome man, and he had a countenance like an angel. But they beat him and they, and, and, and then they stoned him to death. But before he died, he looked up into the heavens and seeing Jesus in the clouds, he said, don't hold it against them, Lord. Don't hold it against them. And then he died. Now, the Jews are the destroyers. They themselves say they are the destroyers. And through what they call creative destruction, they intend to to construct a new kingdom. Their great Christ figure is going to come. But first will come the great serpent whom the Jews worship. Now, I've written a whole book about this. And very few people know of it. I, I, I believe it's the first book ever published on this. You see, I'm just a foolish old man. I'm just a, a foolish old man. I believe in the Bible. I believe sometimes in what the Jews tell me. I've written what the Jews say, what the rabbis have to say. I know what the rabbis say in their Talmud. I've studied it. I know what they say in their Kabbalah. I've studied that. And I have identified what they say about the great and holy serpent, whom they call Leviathan. Leviathan is a word that means also destroyer. Now you can read about Leviathan in the book of Job. Job, you see, had many travails and great horrors happened to him. He lost his whole family and he had a horrible disease over his whole body. And he was, he, he turned out from being rich to, to being a beggar. And he was on the street corner and, and his old friends came to him and made fun of him and said, what have you done? that you've been reduced to this condition. You're a beggar now, a diseased beggar. On the corner, you have no family, you have no house, you have nothing. You're homeless. Why don't why don't you just curse God and die? His friends told him. But God did a number of things with Job. One thing is he told Job of a great serpent. Now, some people say, why is that in the Bible? What has that got to do with Job and all of his horrors and and troubles? Oh, you'll have to read it. The book of Job tells you about Leviathan. And another beast as well called Behemoth. Now, the Jews have taken the story of Job, and they say today they actually worship Leviathan the great beast. He seems to be an important figure. He comes with a light. He's he's the light of the world. He, he He's like a dragon in the sea. He's a great beast. And he comes with like a, a lantern or a light in his head. And his eyes can see with that lantern, with that light. And he's able to withstand pain and torture, and to, to give it to others. Now, the Jews have made up a what I call a myth out of this story in the book of Job of Leviathan. And they tell you about it, even though the Jews in their religion make little note of our uh, book of Revelation. The Jews say it's just silliness. They don't believe in the book of Revelation, because that's the New Testament. But it's interesting that our book of the New Testament in Revelation chapter 9 has this great beast called Abaddon. And he's got many, let's say, spiritual devils with him. This beast is really a great angel, a demonic angel, a dark angel. He comes up believe it or not, in Jerusalem. That city where Jesus was, we'll tell you about that in Revelation 11. 
Yes, he comes up in Jerusalem. And it seems that this great beast takes aim at the two witnesses of God. And he kills them. And their dead bodies lie in the streets of Jerusalem for three days. And then suddenly they rise. And then all hell breaks loose on earth. Now that beast, that Leviathan, that destroyer, is the Messiah of the Jews. They say the beast is our Messiah. It is the beast whom they call Leviathan who is the ruler of this world. And you know what? They're correct. Because Satan as the beast, as the devil, is indeed the ruler of this world. He, he, he's the one, the Bible says, is God, small g, of this world. And, and he, he rules the people of this world. And you know, it's not hard to understand for us today why Donald Trump is having such a tough time, why we as Christians are so hated. I mean, think about it. You bake a cake and you say you don't want to have symbols of, of idolatry. You don't want to have all this homosexual uh, magic about a cake. A cake. You're a baker. And they punish you. I recently read the bakery that refused to bake that cake for some homosexual wedding. How could a homosexual marry? Well, they wanted to, and they demanded this Christian bakery bake them a cake. But they refused, and they were sued, and the authorities got on them, and they've had to close their doors. And throughout America, people have been fired and demoted and maybe never hired in the first place because they held to Christian values. You see, Christian freedom is not very much appreciated today. And Christian liberty, it does not exist in America. And if you insist on having your liberty as a Christian, then the world will take aim at you. They'll destroy you. And they're determined to do so. Believe me. Now, we have a, a ministry here. And I've been told that if a transgender or a homosexual or a married homosexual wants to apply for a job here, that we'd have to hire them. But I say that's nonsense. I say that's nonsense. Well, the destroyer, the Antichrist, is at hand. The beast is at hand. You know, I want to talk to you when we return on the second half of this program about that beast, who he is, what he's going to do, who he's going to tackle and destroy, and what God or how God is going to respond to him. You'll want to know because if this beast is so horrible and our Christian liberties are soon to be wiped out and destroyed, and, and, and you're, you're to be put, you know, in the back of the bus, so to speak, or worse than that. You'll want to know about this beast and what happens because he's going to give you a mark or you're going to take his name or number, that number 666. But of course, everyone who does so, who takes that mark will not see God in heaven. You'll be damned forever and ever. How can you not take the mark then? Well, we'll get into that. When we look at the beast, what he does to the earth and to our families, and what God does to him. I'll be right back after this brief message. Stay with us. This is Tex Mars. You're listening to Power of Prophecy. The Destroyer, the Antichrist, is at hand. It's a new book that I just have out, and boy, is it a hot book. A lot of people are writing me about it, asking me, could this be true? 
that the Jews will produce the Antichrist. And in fact, that the Antichrist, Mr. 666, is at hand. Well, you know, on the front cover of this book is a Bible quote, a very significant quote. It seems that very few people remember this quote today, and they pass it by. But to me, it's very meaningful, one of the most meaningful in all the scriptures. It asks this question, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the son. You know, this is, by the way, from 1 John 2, verse 22. I've talked to many Jews in my life, and they will say, well, we believe in the Father, so we're, we're okay. We're going to heaven. And I ask them, but what about 1 John 2, 2, 2? It says there, if you deny the Son, even though you may say you believe in the Father, you're of the Antichrist. Now, it doesn't say there you're a simple matter of, you know, you're not going to heaven. It goes further than that, doesn't it? I mean, you know, you're placed in a very horrible special category. If you don't believe in the Father and the Son, you are called Antichrist. If you deny that Jesus is Christ, you're a liar. And if you deny the Son at all, you're the Antichrist. Now, there are many Antichrists, but there's one, let's just say a big Antichrist in the last days. But the Jews will get furious with me and say, but I believe in the Father. And I'll say, well, so what? No, you don't. If you don't have the Father, you don't have the Son. On the other hand, Christians who say we have the Son, but we don't believe in the Father, well, then they don't have the Father and the Son. Now, I'm not going to get into a big discussion of the Trinity here today or whether the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are all true. But let me just tell you what the Bible says. In 1 John in the Bible, it says that there are three, three that bear witness in heaven, and these three are one. Now, if you forget either side of that equation, I want you to go back and see it again. There are three, and these three are one. Now, a lot of people write to me and say, well, Tex, there's a Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, of course there are. Then other people write to me and say, but text, there's just one because the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are one. Well, you're correct. <laughs> so what do I believe? Well, I believe what the Bible says. Why can't you just take it for what it says? Why don't you just believe in what the Word of God says? Because you're going to be a liar if you deny that Jesus is Christ. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they say, oh, yeah, we believe in the Father, Jehovah. We just don't believe in the Son. Well, they don't have either one then. That's what makes them a devil religion. And, of course, they're the Mormon religion too. They believe in many, many, many sons, thousands of sons. They don't believe in the Father and the Son. They believe that even the Father was once a man but earned his godhood, and he's got fathers in heaven. So they're mixed up as can be, and they're a devil religion too. How do I say this? Why do I say it? Because by the authority of God, I say these things. Now, the Bible says very clearly there will be a beast in the last days, a beast, and he will rise up from the pit of hell, and there will be many demonic creatures come with him. I'm telling you, friends, it's going to be horrible. It says that people will want to die but cannot. Think about that. People will beg, I want to die. They'll be, they'll be in pain. They'll be hurting because these creatures will sting and torment them. 
I don't know if I've ever been in a pain where I begged God just to take me. I think I was very close to it a few times. But think about that. People will beg to die, but they will not be able to. The beast will be a tormentor. And he will torment all those who have taken his mark or have the name or the number. Is that you, dear friends? Would you dare to take that mark or name or number? Now, some say the Jews will not take it. The Jews are chosen by God, and the Jews are special and holy and sacred. But but wait. Read Matthew 21, verse 43. It says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. The kingdom of God is taken from the Jews. Wow. I didn't know that, you say. Now, I'm going to talk some more about the destroyer today, but I want you to have this book. It's $20. Please add $5 shipping and handling, a total of $25. All you have to do is phone us toll-free, 1-800-234-9673. Now, you can go to our website, powerofprophecy.com or texmars.com or you can write to us at Power of Prophecy 1708 Patterson Road Austin, Texas 78733 as for the destroyer it'll probably be the only time you've ever seen a book like this in print maybe the last I don't know that's up to God of course but I know that it's a, a different book a strange book an unusual book because I asked God to give me the characteristics of the Antichrist and of the beast, the destroyer. And he gave me 55 reasons why it would be a Jew, all related to the Holy Word of God. Now, when you can find 55 things about the Antichrist, 55 characteristics of the Antichrist all of the Bible, what well, must be true? Now, some people will say, well, no, it's going to be a Muslim because of A, B, C, D. Or, well, no, it's going to be somebody from the European community because of A, B, C. I'll say, keep going. Do you have more characteristics? Do you have, say, 30 or 40? Do you have 50 or 55 reasons why it's a European or a, an Assyrian or a a Hittite or whatever. They say, well, no. Well, the destroyer, this book has 55. I have them in the back of the book. I number them. 55 reasons. All right. Let's return to our regular program. Now, I want you to understand that Israel is specially selected for last day's tragedy. Why? Because they were chosen as, well, as God's people. But then God threw them out. He's cast them out. You say, oh, that can't be. Well, read the book of Galatians. You'll see where God cast them out. He cast them out. And I just read to you from Matthew where Jesus took the kingdom from them. And, you know, it's, it's, it's prophesied. You go all the way back to Moses. You go all, all the way back to Isaiah. You can read the prophecy that God gave to the Jews about the last days. Now the Jews say we will end up as the kings of planet earth. We will be gods on earth. And, and, and the great serpent will be our Messiah. That's what they say. I report what they say, what the rabbis say in their Talmud in my book, Holy Serpent of the Jews. But is it true? No, it's not. Now listen to what Moses, Moses had to say this. Think about it. Moses, who with God's help and direction led the Jews out of Egypt into the desert. And finally, of course, they reached the promised land. He says something, you know, on his deathbed, he had a prophecy. You know, there's, there's several places in the Bible. There's one place, of course, where the, 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 the leaders of the 12 tribes are called in to the father. But this is an important place. This is Moses. Moses gives them a prophecy. He said this to the Jews. 
who of course were not Jews, but were, you know, Israelites during that time. He said, for I know that after my death, you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn away from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days. What did Moses say? Did he say you will receive a kingdom? Did he say your Messiah will be the wise serpent and you'll be the serpent people? Did he say the, 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 rap, the, the, the Gentiles will serve you and you'll have all the riches of earth as your possession? No, 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 no. Moses said you will corrupt yourselves and you'll turn away from the holy and righteous way that I've commanded you and evil will befall you when, when in the latter days. That's Moses' prophecy. Now, you can sit in your living room. You can sit on your pew at church, and your pastor can call Moses a liar. He can say this is not true, that Moses gave a false prophecy. But I'm here to tell you that he's that Moses gave this from his deathbed, and it is accurate, and it is true, and it, it, it chronicles exactly what will happen and has happened to Israel. He says, evil will befall you in the latter days because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Wow. What is the work of their hands? Now, God often refers that to the making of idols. And what is the holy idol of Israel? What is their flag? Well, it's the six-pointed star. They made that six-pointed star their flag. Rothschild adopted it. And, and, and the, the successive uh, Jews, the, their administrations have adopted it. And now it's on their flag. Well, let's go from Moses to Isaiah, the great prophet Isaiah. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. Those of you who say that Israel will, will receive a kingdom and that they will be favored by God in the last days and that the Gentiles will all work for them and they will be glorious and holy and all of that, I want you to understand what Isaiah prophesied. Now, get this in your heart, in your mind. This is the fate of the Jews. This is the destiny of the Jews. This is what will happen to the beast that they create with the works of their own hands, that six-pointed star that is numerically coded 666. He said, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem. He's identifying them. Hear the word of the Lord, he says. You scornful men. You, you've scorned the word, the word of God before, but I want you to listen to it, he says. And then he, then he says, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. Now let's stop there a moment. Think of it. Has Israel made a covenant with death? Who is death? Who is death? Why, that's Satan. Satan is the, the bringer of death. He's, he's the one who ushers in death. God brings life and life eternal, abundant life. But Satan brings only death and corruption. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death. They, they didn't just associate themselves with it or play with it or get affiliated or burned by it even. They made a covenant with it, an agreement. Did they not? When they crucified Jesus, did not the Jews make a covenant with death? Oh, I've got a lot here to read about that. Because God said, I, I, I'll give them my son. Surely they won't kill him. Surely they'll honor him. But the husbandmen, the gospels say, the Jews took him and slew him because they said, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him. And then it'll all be ours. It'll all be ours. And they killed him and they slew him. 
Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. Isaiah, that doesn't leave any room for argument, does he? <laughs> have, you, have you ever had anybody that evil? And you told them you've made a covenant with death and with hell you're at agreement? I mean, this is like a psychotic killer. These are evil people. Isaiah said, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge. And under falsehood have we hid ourselves. What do the Jews say? When the overflowing scourge comes, it won't touch us. We're, we're safe in this land of Israel now. We've got atomic bombs. We've got nuclear submarines. We've got jet aircraft that can deliver these bombs even to the capitals of Europe, said Professor Martin Craval, one of the top professors in Israel. Don't dare to say that we're going to lose, we're going to win. We'll destroy the whole world before we go under. When the overflowing scourge passes by, it won't come on us. My friends, listen, Israel has made lies their refuge. They've killed, they've maimed the Palestinians, the Lebanese, and all the other peoples. And today they're the ones telling our Obama Go out and kill, kill, kill. They told Hillary Clinton. They tell, they're telling telling John Kerry, kill the Iraqis. Kill the Jordanians. Kill the Iranians. Kill the Syrians. Kill the Lebanese. And exalt Israel. And they lie. They say, we're, a, we're a nation of peace. We're a nation of peace. They made lies their refuge. Under falsehoods have they hid themselves. And they try to tell the whole world we're a great nation and a nation of peace and love. But even the world doesn't believe them. Even the world knows they're liars. Therefore, as Isaiah continued, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure Foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. What does this mean? Well, God says, I know all the evil you've done, but I laid in Zion a foundation, a stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And if you believe, <laughs> you're not being hasty, you're being patient. You're, you're establishing yourself. You've got something eternal. It's not hasty. You're not making haste. You're, you're making a firm and lasting, safe foundation. Then God says to Isaiah, to Israel, judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. Do you know what a plummet is? It's a, a, a you know, tool that plumbers use. And when it says there, judgment also will I lay to the line, it means his judgment is going to be accurate. And every bit of it will be judged, and nothing will be left to chance. And you can't say, oh, well, I did this, or I had this excuse, or whatever. No. God, God knows all excuses. He knows all of the mitigating factors and circumstances. And he... he <laughs> He makes you lay it to the line and has the plummet there, and it's balanced. Exactly. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. You can't hide, not in these last days. No, the waters will overtake you, and your refuge of lies will be swept away. And then God says, and your covenant with death shall be disannulled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. That's it, folks. That's what happens to Israel. That's the destiny of Israel. Now, many people say, I want the destiny of Israel to be my destiny. 
I'm Israel. I, I, I love Israel. Well, I, I love Israel too. But I know their destiny is a bad one. But not everyone. You see, there's some Jews who have accepted Jesus. There's some Jews who are not arrogant and smug who will say, Lord, in my humility, help me to understand. Help me to know these things. Help me to understand what Tex Mars has told me today. Help me to understand these, these scriptures, the word of God. Help me to understand why Moses and Isaiah warned of these things. Help me to understand that I, there's no beast that's going to help me. There's no serpent named Leviathan that, that, that is the God of, uh, of Israel. There's only one God, Jesus Christ. Help me to know and understand this. Help me to love you, Jesus. And then perhaps Jesus will have mercy. Perhaps Jesus will say, enter therein. <laughs> I've stood at the door and knocked, and you've opened the door. You've let me in. Maybe God will say that. He says he will say that. I know he will say it to some. Now, many people say, well, Tex Mars, you... You're always knocking the Jews. You evidently don't believe the Jews will be saved. Have I ever said that? You know that's not true. Some say, well, uh, you know, you don't love the Muslims. You don't want them to come to the United States. You know, you, you don't you don't want them to, to 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 come here in the millions like they've been coming. And 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 you you, well, have I ever said that? No, I believe things should be lawful. I think we should we should obey the laws, and 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 I, I frankly, I've always been for some Muslims coming to America, but I I wanted the Muslims to come here so we could preach to them, so we could save them, so we could show them what we are as Christians. But it seems that the Muslims that are here are hateful. Many of them, they hate us. Why do they hate us? Well. Because maybe because we don't live up to our standards, or maybe they just hate Jesus Christ. But in any case, all those Muslims coming here are not finding Jesus, it seems. They're, instead, they're praising their Muhammad and <sighs> hating Christianity. And the same thing came for the, is true of the Jews who live here amongst us, but they don't assimilate. They have their own ways. They have their own religion. And I'm opposed to that. Of course I am. Why, well, only only a foolish non-Christian would be happy with such a circumstance. Why? Because I want to see Muslims happy. I want to see Muslims who become Christians. I want to see Muslims who understand the word of God and know that Jesus is true, that he is the very son of God. I'd like to see all these Muslim mosques that are opening up in Houston, Texas, Cleveland, Ohio, and New York City. I'd like to see them all closed down. Actually, I'd like to see them put a cross out front, take down that Muslim crescent moon and the star. You know, many Muslims don't even know what that... Crescent Moon of the Star stands for. I had one write to me and was telling me all kind of great things about Islam and how it was going to take over America. And, and I, I wrote him back and I said, well, my dear friend, do you, in your praise of Islam, do you even know what your star and crescent symbols mean? Because your Islam says they don't believe in the Islamic faith, in symbols. You think that they're idols and, and they're very evil, but you've got them on your mosque. Would you like me to tell you what they stand for? And he wrote me back and said, yes, I'd, I'd like to know. I asked my imam, that's the, 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 the pastor, the, uh, the head of that uh, congregation or church, the Islamic uh, congregation. I asked him and he didn't know either. He said, well, we've always just had them there. Really? You can't just have a symbol. Stand on your church. 
and, know, and not know what it means. That's why I tell everybody what the Jewish Star of David means. It's hellish. you got to understand it, and you can understand it in Acts 6 and 7 in the Bible. The, God won't leave you void of knowledge. So I wrote this young man, and I told him about the, the star and the crescent. And by the way, we have an entire a tape message about that. And I take you back in history and show you the star. Uh, and, and it's a sign of the great goddess. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a terrible thing. And I tell you about uh, Muhammad. And, and, I, and I actually preach from, uh, not from, but I, I preach uh, on what the Quran has to say. And the Hadith, another book. But I show also that Jesus Christ is truly Lord and that Muhammad was a false prophet. And the same thing goes true for Judaism. Now today, the Jews would like Christians and Muslims to fight, to battle together. That's why they're bringing all of these these refugees to the United States. They're wanting us to battle them. They're wanting us to hate the Muslims. They're wanting us to say, these are terrorists. We hate these people. They're going to be surprised, friends, because true Christians don't hate. True Christians will reach out to these Muslims. Now, we have a right as a nation not to accept people who don't love our country, who don't love our founding fathers, who don't love us. We don't have to accept them in our country. There's 7 billion people in the world. We can't take them all. We don't have to accept the Muslims in this country. But those that are here, that, that somehow arrive here, well, what we can do is tell them about Jesus. We can tell them about his love. We can preach to them the truth. And maybe, just maybe some will come to know him. And then they won't get caught up by the destroyer. Because you see, the destroyer is at hand. This beast is here. The Jews are ruling. I want you to understand that they believe in the serpent and he's here. I mean, come on, look at Hollywood, look at Broadway, look at all of the, the, the sinful music and everything we have. Everywhere you turn, the, the sign of the Antichrist is there. It's there. But remember this. The sign of Jesus is there too. The sign of the cross, the sign of the one who died for us. It's there too. Even were they to take down the cross and destroy it, which they might do, many churches are doing that, it'll be in your heart, in your soul, what happened on the cross, that Jesus died for your sins and mine. And if the Antichrist is at hand, well, that just means it's closer to his destiny. What happens to the Antichrist? What happens to the beast? Well, you could read about it for yourself in the book of Revelation. In fact, in the very uh, back of uh, the book of Revelation, it, it talks about Gog and Magog, these beasts of hell. And it talks about the camp of the saints. The camp. You see, Gog and Magog come up against the camp of the saints. And that's where they make their fatal mistake. That's where God destroys these horrible forces through his marvelous light. It's all in the Bible. It will happen just the way God said it would. This is Tex Mars. It's been great being with you, discussing the Bible and its prophecies. My prayer is that you'll tune in each week during the same time and discover the power of prophecy. Prophecy. 